Welcome again to another God and Country class. And of course, we are learning about America's godly heritage, good economics, and the proper role of government, snacks, friends, and saving our country. So thank you, Laura, again for the wonderful food. Mm -hmm. So let's be encouraged. Last week we watched uh, James Robinson talk about how in the 1980s, uh, actually 1980, him and other Christian leaders became um, aroused to call upon God to help save our nation and that they called a whole bunch of Christians together and they invited all the presidential candidates that year and only one showed up. Of course, that was Ronald Reagan. And last week we watched the presentation that James Robinson gave and it was fiery and, and every single word he gave was applicable to today. Just talking about our, you know, the national debt and printing money to pay off things that we can't afford. And um, So what we're going to do now is we're going to follow up and watch what happened after he sat down and Ronald Reagan got up to address the crowd. So I think we'll be very encouraged. Our two good governors who are here, Dr. Criswell, Reverend Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen here on the platform, and you ladies and gentlemen. You know, a few days ago, I addressed a group in Chicago and received their endorsement for my candidacy. Now, I know this is a nonpartisan gathering, and so I know that you can't endorse me, but I only brought that up because I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. Since the start of my presidential campaign, I and many others have felt a new vitality in American politics, a fresh sense of purpose, a deeper feeling of commitment is giving new energy and new direction to our public life. You are the reason. Religious America is awakening, perhaps just in time, for our country's sake. I've seen the impact of your dedication. I know the sincerity of your intent, and I'm deeply honored to be with you here tonight. You know, I'm told that throughout history, Man has adopted about four billion laws. It's always seemed to me, however, that in all that time and with all those laws, we haven't improved by one iota on the Ten Commandments. Today, you and I are meeting at a time when traditional Judeo-Christian values based on the moral teachings of religion, are undergoing what is perhaps their most serious challenge in our nation's history. Nowhere is the challenge to traditional values more pronounced or more dangerous than in the area of public policy debate. So it's fitting that the topic of our meeting should be national affairs, for it is precisely in the affairs of our nation where the challenge to those values is the greatest. In recent years, we've seen a new and cynical attack on the part of those who would seek to remove from our public policy debate the voice of traditional morality. This tactic seeks not only to discredit traditional moral teachings, but also to exclude them from public debate by intimidation and name-calling, as we were so eloquently told just a short time ago. We have all heard it charged that whenever those with traditional religious values seek to contribute to public policy, they're attempting to impose their views on others. We're told that any public policy approach incorporating traditional values is out of bounds. This is a matter that transcends partisan politics and demands the attention of every American regardless of party. If we have come to a time in the United States when the attempt to see traditional moral values reflected in public policy leaves one open to irresponsible charges, then the structure of our free society is under attack and the foundation of our freedom is threatened. Under the pretense of separation of church and state, 
Religious beliefs cannot be advocated in many of our public institutions, but atheism can. You know, I've often had a fantasy. I thought of serving an atheist a delicious gourmet dinner and then asking he or she whether they believed there was a cook. When I hear the First Amendment used as a reason to keep traditional moral values away from policy making, I'm shocked. The First Amendment was written not to protect the people and their laws from religious values, but to protect those values from government tyranny. This is what Madison meant when he drafted the Constitution and that precious First Amendment. This is what the state legislatures meant when they ratified it. And this is what a long line of Supreme Court decisions have meant. But over the last two or three decades, the federal government seems to have forgotten both that old-time religion and that old-time Constitution. In our own country, we can get our house back in order. The drugs that ravage the young, the street crimes that terrorize the elderly, these are not necessary parts of life. Despite some in... Despite some intolerable court decisions, we do not have to forever tolerate the pornography that defaces our neighborhoods. the permissiveness that permeates our schools. We can break the yoke of poverty by unleashing America's economic power for growth and expansion, not by making anyone the perpetual ward of the state. We can cherish our agent, helping families to care for one another rather than driving their members into impersonal dependence upon government programs and government institutions. When I made the decision to seek the presidency, I quoted one of those early colonists who landed on the Massachusetts shore, telling the little band with him that the eyes of all mankind were on them and that they could be as a shining city upon a hill. Well, the eyes of all mankind are still upon us, pleading with us to keep our rendezvous with destiny, to give hope to all who yearn for freedom and cherish human dignity. We have God's promise that if we turn to Him and ask His help, we shall have it. With His help, we can still become that shining city upon a hill. I have always believed that every blessing brings with it a responsibility. The responsibility to use that blessing wisely, to share it generously and to preserve it for those who come after us. If we believe God has blessed America with liberty, then we have not just a right to vote, but a duty to vote. We, we have not just the freedom to work in campaigns and run for office and comment on public affairs, we have a responsibility as you've already been told again so eloquently tonight, to do so. That is the only way to preserve our blessings, extend them to others and hand them on to our children. If you do not speak your mind and cast your ballots, then who will speak and work for the ideals we cherish? Who will vote to protect the American family and respect its interest in the formulation of public policy? Who, if not you, and millions more like you, will vote to defend the defenseless and the weak, the very young, the poor, and the very old. When you stand up for your values, when you assert your civil rights to vote and to participate fully in government, you're defending our true heritage of religious liberty. You're standing in the tradition of Roger Williams, Isaac Backus, and all the other dissenters who established for us the rights of religious conscience. Much has changed since the Constitution guaranteed all Americans their religious liberty. But some things must never change. 
The perils our country faces today and will face in the 1980s seem unprecedented in their scope and consequences. But our response to them can be the response of men and women in any era who seek divine guidance in the policies of their government and the promulgation of their laws. When the Israelites were about to enter the promised land, they were told that their government and laws must be models to other nations, showing to the world the wisdom and mercy of their God. To us, as to the ancient people of the promise, there is given an opportunity, a chance to make our laws and government not only a model to mankind, but a testament to the wisdom and mercy of God. Let it be said of us, let it be said of us, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. May I close on a personal note? I was asked once in a press interview what book I would choose if I were shipwrecked on an island and could have only one book for the rest of my life. I replied that I knew of only one book that could be read and reread and continue to be a challenge. The Bible, the Old and New Testaments. I can only add to that, my friends, that I continue to look to the scriptures today for fulfillment and for guidance. Indeed, it is an incontrovertible fact that all the complex and horrendous questions confronting us at home and worldwide have their answer in that single book. I, I, one more moment of your time and maybe here I'm telling a little story that you perhaps have already seen I don't know how it is being circulated I only know that it came into my hands by way of a friend it was a card a single paragraph on that card author unknown but the author was telling the story of a dream the author had had a dream of walking on the beach beside the Lord while all the scenes of his lifetime flashed in the heavens above, leaving the two pairs of footprints in the sand. And then as the final scene of his life was on the sky, he turned around and looked back at the path on the beach. And he saw that every once in a while, there was only one set of footprints. And he said that every time the one set of footprints came at the time when the scene in the sky was of, of a terribly troublesome and despairing time in his life. And he said, Lord, you said that if I would follow you, you would walk beside me, that I would always have your help. Why is it that in the times when I needed you most, you left me, and I see only one set of footprints? And the Lord said, my precious child, I would never leave you in your time of trouble. When you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I basically thought that that speech, just like the sermon that was given before it last week that we listened to, I thought everything you said could be apply to today, which is amazing because that was 34 years ago. So I, I think that what I want us to take away from this is, number one, hope that when God's people really do become active and when, when we pray, when we get involved, that God can raise up a person to not save us, not like we're looking for a Savior, but that someone to represent us well. 
uh, someone to be a good leader. Um, but I want us to be encouraged that it has happened before and that there's nothing stopping it from happening again. In other words, I, I would call it more of a formula than anything else. In other words, there's a formula. You've got to pray, you've got to become active, you've got to be educated, and it can happen. So I want us to be encouraged that it's happened before and then it can ha happen again. So I want to talk about uh, a little theme here that I call from the pilgrims to the present. From the pilgrims to the present. The theme is clear. Some people live according to the Bible and some don't. America's history has the blemishes of those who didn't and the blessings of those who did. Keeping that in mind, America really was founded on godly biblical principles. I've recently read a book called The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall and David Manuel. Uh, the Light and the Glory basically asks the question, uh, where was God from Christopher Columbus all the way to the present? And it says, uh, with all the things that have happened, did God really have a hand in our country? And it's a, it's a great book. It's not a perfect book. I think he gets some things wrong. Um, he throws his opinion in places quite weightily sometimes, and I think it may not be appropriate, but um, to get some good ideas of history, I think it's a pretty good book. In The Light and the Glory, I learned that different kinds of people came to the New World for different reasons. Some came for religious reasons, and some came seeking fortune. Now, I'm not against seeking fortune at all. I believe that that's quite appropriate, but in our history, it seems like those came seeking fortune often abused the natives, and those who came for religious reasons often treated the natives, the Indians, with respect and care. Of course, there you've got uh, those uh, friars, and of course, on the other side, you've got a statue there of someone I'll call the gold seekers, people who came here seeking fortune. The gold seekers. Um, from the Spanish conquistadors to the settlers in Virginia who came seeking fortune in the form of native gold. Essentially, uh, across Europe, the, the stories of, of native gold here were just running rampant across Europe. Uh, it was almost just inflamed rhetoric and, and almost to a crazed point where people thought that if you could just come here and just, just find an Indian, you could somehow trade him you know, trade them your boots for a bucket of gold. I mean, it was almost just ridiculous. So you had people coming here trying to get rich. You had people who were in debt. Uh, you had uh, gentlemen coming to, to really, um, you know, have some sort of great adventure or who knows what it was, but one way or another, you had a gold craze. And when they came here, they, they found that something else was true. It was not necessarily the stories that they were told, but these gold seekers may have come in the name of the Lord. In other words, a lot of them said, we're going to share the gospel with the natives and we're going to do this and do that. But really, when they came here, it was all about the gold. It was all about the fortune. Um, many of them actually stole from the Indians and, and killed them for their corn. In other words, they, they really did abuse the natives. Their true motives overshadowed any hollow shell of a desire to spread the gospel to the Indians. So that was the gold seekers. These gold seekers brought some Franciscan and Dominican friars with them to the New World. These friars were actually living for the Lord. They were actually seeking to live according to the Bible. They built orphanages and schools for the Indians, as well as refuges for the destitute. Through the friars' service, thousands of Indians were compelled by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some friars even gave their lives as martyrs so the Indians could hear about Jesus. The lesson is you cannot just lump all the first newcomers uh, to the new world in one category. There was a clear distinction between those who came out of greed for gold and those who truly came to spread the light of the world to the natives who inhabited the land. That distinction proves true throughout all history. Those who live according to the Bible and those don't. A side note. It also cannot be said that all Indians, all natives, were alike as well. You cannot lump them all together just as you can't lump all the newcomers together. Some Indians were peaceful and had good relations with the newcomers. Other Indians were brutal, savage, and actually evil. They even tortured some of those friars who loved and served them. 
And in, in that book, uh, there's actually stories of, uh, I believe it was the, the Iroquois tribe. Uh, they were one of these tribes that when they would uh, capture, you know, capture an enemy, they would oftentimes take them and they would uh, tie one person up and actually flay their flesh off of them while their family members would watch. And they would essentially torture one of their family members while the others would watch and scream and cry, etc. Um, the stories uh, were actually very, very brutal to read. But essentially, um, there were some Indians that were just positively evil and positively brutal. Um, there was one friar that they had captured, you know, one of these loving friars that was there to serve them, etc. And they captured him, and so they were torturing him. And this friar would not give them the satisfaction of, of hearing him cry out in pain and in terror. So they would torture him, they would be cutting off his flesh, they would be burning him, doing all these things to him, and he just would not, would not show them his fear. So they would in increase the, the intensity level of the torture uh, to the point where he just would not he just would not scream in terror and he would not give them that satisfaction. They ended up simply cutting out his heart and eating it because they thought that they would get some of that spirit, that same spirit that made him strong. They ate his heart. Um, so uh, the point is that you can't just lump all the newcomers together, you can't just lump all the Indians together. That once again, it, you have to deal with them on an individual basis. Let's talk about the Puritans of the Virginia Company. Now, I love my Virginia. I'm a Virginian. But when the Puritans came to America, they came to work. They came up, of course, uh, Plymouth Rock, up in Massachusetts. The Puritans came to work, to live, and to worship freely. If anyone has watched the Monumental movie with Kirk Cameron, uh, it's a great movie, and it talks about how those separatists and those Puritans came to live out their faith according to the Bible here in this new world. They prospered and they flourished. When the Virginia Company landed at Jamestown, many of these were gentlemen who wouldn't work. It was thought to be beneath them. Just the idea of doing manual labor, uh, they couldn't even bear it. Um, others were simply lazy or chose to steal from the Indians instead of planting their own crops. In fact, uh, those first couple winters, they were actually attempting socialism, Marxism. And actually, when they came here, they said, we're going to have a storehouse, and when everyone works, then uh, you, know, you, you put what you've created and what you've grown in the storehouse, and everyone, as they have need, can go and get from the storehouse. So, of course, able-bodied people started faking that they were sick. And all of a sudden, people were just lazy or... or too tired or whatever it was, people would make up excuses, as we can imagine, and people starved. And so they actually had a couple winters of starvation, and then the governor said, why don't we try something else? So he actually gave each family private property. Said, you can do whatever you want with this property. Whatever you grow, you can either eat, you can consume, or you can sell. You can do whatever you want with it. It's yours, and guess what? In a very, very short period of time, we went from starving to actually exporting crops and corn, etc. Because each person became very, very industrious. So there's a difference between the Puritans who came originally to live out their faith in the Bible and those that came in the Virginia Company, some that, um, some that might have been, in fact, good people, but others who simply would not work and even chose to steal and kill instead of simply being industrious and working. Uh, the phrase, if you're not willing to work, you must not eat. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's biblical. That's right. That's biblical. Once again, we see a difference between some settlers who came and sought to live their lives according to the Bible and those who didn't. This was further displayed by those who understood the biblical mandate to work in order to meet one's own needs versus those who thought work was beneath them and thought someone else should be providing for them. Let's continue learning about America's godly heritage. Let's talk about the Christian church's influence on our founding documents. This should be very encouraging. Let's actually watch another video here about how sermons influenced the Declaration. These revolutionary ideas that the Founding Fathers placed in their documents came from a primary source. The primary source was the Bible. 
I said, oh, no, no, that, that's not possible. The Bible's not political. Time out. Let's do a little historical analysis here. What you have is we have in American history thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of written documents. Previous generations did on paper what we do with cameras and tapes and VCRs. They wrote everything down. They all kept diaries and memoirs. And George Washington has 100 volumes of writings and John Adams has 33 and Jefferson has 60. They wrote it all down. One of the things they kept written records of was sermons. Because unlike today, sermons back then were all written. You didn't just stand up in the pulpit and preach a sermon. You stood up in the pulpit and you read a sermon. It was not until the Second Great Awakening that we started having extemporary kind of sermons where you would actually preach a sermon without having it written out first. Wow. So we have tens of thousands of written sermons out of the colonial times. You will find there is nothing covered in the Declaration of Independence that had not already been dealt with in the pulpit before 1763. Who are some of those people? Wow. Well, a great, great example. Uh, take the Declaration of Independence. All these ideas, the consent of the governed and taxation, that representation, all these things that came out in the Declaration, you can track so many of them back to the Reverend John Wise. The Reverend John Wise is a name we never hear about today. Now, Clinton Roster is an award-winning American historian. He wrote a book called The Seed Time of the Republic. Wow. What are the ideas that birthed the revolution? He tracked it back to six individuals. He, he considered these six individuals to be the, the greatest intellectual influence on American independence. Of the six individuals, two were political folks and four were preachers of the gospel. One of the preachers he points to is the Reverend John Wise. Now, this is the work from Reverend John Wise. This is, this is his work from 1710 and 1717, two, two works that he has here. Reverend Wise is a preacher in Massachusetts, and by 1687, he had already shown out of the Bible that taxation without representation was tyranny. He had already shown and preached out of the Bible that the consent of the governed is the basis of biblical government. He had already shown out of the Bible that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their Creator with certain rights. Now, that sounds like things in the Declaration. Yeah, exactly. It was preached in the pulpit by the Reverend wow. John Wise. This particular edition of, of his works that I'm holding here is from 1772. And what makes this significant is in 1772 they reprinted his works. Who reprinted it? Well, you can take folks like Ebenezer Dorr. Ebenezer Dorr is the guy who rode with Paul Revere to sound the alarm. Uh, you can take the, the, the guy who was head of the Boston Tea Party. He's the guy who reprinted this book. Artemis Ward, who was the first commander-in-chief before George Washington was appointed as commander-in-chief, he reprinted this book. You find the guys who reprinted the 1772 book were the guys who led the American Revolution. When this book came out in 1772, it sold out so fast they did another quick reprinting. This went to all the patriots. It, it renewed their thinking. Oh yeah, that's right. Taxation, that representation is tyranny. The consent of the government came right out of those sermons. And, and, and we used to know that. I think there are a number of significant things here. Number one is, uh, it speaks to what preachers should be what talking about today. What has happened to the foundation coming from our pulpits? Right, right. Well, and so uh, Reverend Wise uh, actually purchased the book he, he referenced there by Clinton Roster. And I was reading the other day um, about Reverend John Wise, and he was actually a remarkable character. He was actually... Uh, there are no uh, likenesses of him, so no pictures of him, but he was described as a great, big, strong man. And apparently he was actually a wrestler, somewhat of an amateur wrestler, I guess. And um, I guess he was somewhat of a, of, a, of a champion, a regional champion in wrestling. Very, very large, big, strong man. Very forceful in presence, but also just striking in appearance. And so there's a story told when um, he was getting older in life. Uh, a champion, a wrestling champion from another town came and challenged him to a wrestling match. And, you know, the Reverend John Wise was just saying, no, I'm, I'm old and I'm kind of sick and you know, I don't want to do it. And this, this other champion was just kind of goading him on and saying, come on now. So Reverend Wise gave in and, and within just a few moments, um, John Wise had picked the other individual up and thrown him over the fence in his yard and the man quickly got up and brushed himself off and, and declared to Reverend John Wise, if you'll just throw me my horse, I'll be on my way. <laughs> so this is the Reverend John Wise, really remarkable individual. But, you know, the um, David Barton, who, is, who we were listening to, I'll, I'll refer to him later, but 
Um, he's got so many of those old written sermons from the colonial times and that pre-founding era time even. And what he has discovered is that preachers used to talk about whatever was going on that week, that's what the, the preacher was talking about Sunday morning. So, you know, if there was a, a solar eclipse during the week, well, well, what does the Bible have to say about solar eclipse? Or if it was election time, well, let's have a sermon about election time. Whatever people were thinking about, that's what they were going to talk about. And, you know, today, you know, you go to church and you may hear the gospel, you know, the literal gospel of Jesus Christ preached a million times. But if, if you've already given your life to Jesus, well, you may need to learn something else. And I'm not saying to stop preaching the gospel every Sunday. I'm just saying, you know, why don't you give me something new on Sunday morning? Why don't you give me some new education here? And um, I think a lot of people, even if they're believers, they've stopped going to church because it's not relevant to their lives. In other words, they may hear just the same few themes, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year. And they think, well... They either don't care or they've got it and they think, well, how is this productive for me? This, this, you know, you're not talking about anything I'm actually thinking about during the week, so why am I going to go and listen to you? But I think that if, if preachers and, and pastors actually started talking about the things we're all thinking about anyway, you know, maybe we would form some better opinions than, you know, what some news source says about it or what some commentator says about it. Maybe we would find out, you know, if we would find out what God's Word says about it then maybe we would be better voters. So one thing I, I take away from this is that uh, preachers and pastors should be encouraged to start making an impact on culture, what government looks like. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that essentially uh, our declaration, as he says, uh, they, these were all topics that were dealt with in sermons before that time. So the people were primed and ready for the declaration because of the sermons that they've been hearing for generations. Let's talk about the Bible, John Locke, and the Declaration of Independence. John Locke, of course, is uh, one of his greatest works, Two Treatises of Government. Donald Lutz, who wrote the book The Origins of American Constitutionalism, claims that John Locke uh, was the single most frequently cited source in the years from 1760 to 1776. The signer of Declaration of Independence, Richard Henry Lee, said um, that the Declaration of Independence was essentially copied from Locke's two treatises on government. So, essentially, he was saying that the ideas are basically identical, okay? Locke and the Declaration. Thomas Jefferson said that Locke was among my trinity of the three greatest men the world had ever produced. So, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the main author behind the Declaration said, Locke is one of my three favorite guys ever. So we've laid a little bit of foundation. What's the point? With such importance being placed on John Locke's influence during the founding era of the United States, it is very useful to understand one thing. John Locke's two treatises of government referenced over 1,500 Bible verses. And the whole book was only 400 pages long. So that's over three times per page, if you divide it up evenly, that he referenced Scripture. So does that, does that make sense? Does that impact you? So, let's go back one. Okay, John Locke, most frequently cited source from 1760 to 1776. John Locke. Signer of the Declaration, Richard Henry Lee said, basically the Declaration was a copy of John Locke. Thomas Jefferson said, this guy, one of my three most important people on, on this earth. And this guy quoted scripture, or at least referenced it in one way or another, over 1,500 times. And this is what influenced our Declaration of Independence. This is, in addition to individuals like John Wise, this is what formed the thinking and what filled the thoughts of those revolutionary individuals that gave us a declaration. So when someone says separation of church and state, you can't pray at a football game. Why? Exactly. There is no such thing as separation of church and state. Well, and, well as, as Jefferson said it, it was basically to separate, like Reagan said, to prevent the state from encroaching upon that's right. the church. First so Amendment. That's right, First Amendment, exactly. Well, what does it say? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, 
or bridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and the petition the government for redress of grievances. That's right. So Congress can't stop them. That's right. There's no separation of church and state in there. And, and, and if you go back to the original intent, it's essentially to protect the church from the state.